I think with all of us, some of our best laid out plans can go awry, can't they? The name of the minister who always had a parishioner fell asleep in the middle of his message. So one Sunday he thought, I'm going to get even. And so during the message, once the parishioner fell asleep, he very quietly said, for all you folks that want to go to heaven, please stand up. And of course the congregation stood up except for this one that was asleep. And then he said, for all those that want to go to hell, stand up! And as he screamed at this guy, was startled. He jumped right up in the air. And he looked around and he said, man, pastor, I don't know where we're going, but it just looks like you and I are on this journey. <laughs> I don't think the pastor quite want that response. Well, this morning we'll be taking a look at communion. And let me just say this in case I fail to mention it later. When it comes to communion here in the Turnpike Wesleyan Church, communion is open to everyone who has a relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have to be an attendee of the church. You don't have to be a member of the church. If you're part of God's family, when it comes to that place and time for communion, we invite you to come to the Lord's table and celebrate what he's done with the rest of the church family. Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 is our key text for today. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the work you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Abraham Lincoln was once asked how he was going to treat the rebellious Southerners once they were finally defeated and reinstated into the Union. Now, the person asking the question feared that the president would express his anger, would seek out vengeance. However, the president, in his calm way, simply said, I will treat them as if they had never been away. I want you to keep that comment, that statement in mind, because the Word of God tells us that we were once enemies to Jesus Christ. That we were sinners, we were rebellious, we were troublemakers. Yet when the grace of God came into our own hearts, when we received Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, it was as though God treated us as if we had never left. He brought us back home like the prodigal son, and he put his arms around us and embraced us. I love the words of the songwriter, actually the hymn writer, that goes like this. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he would love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. You know, as we come to this point of getting our hearts prepared for communion, I hope it's because we understand the awesomeness of God's love. In fact, the Word of God says that the only reason you and I know anything about love is because He first loved us. And that brings me to a central thrust of today's message. Do you still love Him this morning as you did that moment you gave your heart to Him? Has your love somewhat waned? Has it somewhat been misguided? Have you gone adrift? Well, today God's saying, come back to a place where we can renew that love relationship. So what we're asking this morning is that in our fellowship with God, we want it to be alive. We want it to be fresh. Now, I would say some of you in this place have been saved for a number of years. So let me ask, is the light still burning brightly in your life? There's others who are new Christians. They're young Christians. 
Is your experience with Christ still filled with excitement and abundancy? I pray it is. Is there a zippity doo dah that exists in your song, in your heart? Is there a skip, a hearty skip in your spiritual walk? Again, that's my prayer that those things exist. That reminds me of a small town that I heard about. A motorist was driving through and he needed gas. It was kind of late at night. So as he stopped and filled up his gas tank, he went into the station and asked the attendant, is there any place I can get a bite to eat around this place? And the attendant says, well, you know, we do have a cafe a bit down the road, but they're closed at six. So the guy says, well, what do you do for excitement around here? The attendant paused and said, well, around here, folks, don't get too excited. <laughs> well, I pray that's not what happens in God's house. As we make preparation for communion, and allow God that liberty to deal with you as he so desires, as he deems necessary. You may be wondering why I picked out Revelation 2 for communion. Well, there are three thoughts that Jesus shares in this particular scripture text. Two are positive. But sandwiched in the middle is a negative. He brings out three expressions, not only to the church in Ephesus, but for you and I who are reading this portion of Scripture. It's an expression of commendation, commending the people for what they were doing, commending his children, an expression of condemnation, and an expression of consecration. Let's look first at commendation. I was reading of a young mulatto girl that was being sold at an auction back in the 19th century. She was a beautiful girl, tall and slender. The bidding for her was keen, and it quickly mounted higher and higher until at last only two individuals were left bidding on this lady. One was an uncouth fellow who swore every time he rose his bid. The other was a gentleman, a refined individual, quiet as he put in his bid. When the bidding finally came to a conclusion, it was the gentleman that had finally found the ownership of this girl. He had her papers. He now was the lawful owner of her. And so the auctioneer shoved the Delano girl towards her new owner. But she stood before him very defiant, very stubborn, almost speaking with her face you're not going to tell me what to do. You're not going to break me. I will never, ever serve you. But all of a sudden, that countenance changed. First, there was a look of bewilderment, a look of amazement, and then finally, a complete look of disbelief. For her new owner was actually ripping up the papers of ownership. And with a smile, he said to this trembling girl, My dear, you are free. I bought you that I may free you. The lady was speechless. She didn't know what to do. However, she fell at the man's feet. And in tears, when she finally got her voice back, she exclaimed, Oh, mister, I will love you and I will serve you for all my life. You see, what the law and what documents and papers of ownership could not do, the kindness, the gentleness, and the mercy of this man's actions actually accomplished. Why am I sharing this? Because it does display in some regard God's love for you and I. What he did when he sent his son to die upon the cross to redeem us. And because that price was so significant, that he tore up the debt certificate, that we no longer stand guilty in his presence. Don't you think that I should respond the same way the servant girl did? Lord, I love you. I will serve you for all of my ways, for all of my life. How did this church respond at first? It tells us through good deeds, hard work, and perseverance. You know, that word perseverance actually means to strive to the point of exhaustion. Be willing to pour out yourself, to pay a price, to be an empty vessel for the Lord. At first, that's what this church wanted to do. 
At first, that's the way you and I are when we accept Jesus Christ. This is they had not tolerated those that were evil. In other words, they did not allow the culture around them to define Christianity. They didn't allow the world to mold them into its way of thinking. No, they were quick to understand. We need to stand guard and be a safeguard to the word of truth. We need to defend the word of truth with all of our might. And it says that they did not grow weary. They were active and energetic for the cause of Christ. What tremendous words of commendation. Words that any church, words of any person would love to hear from our Savior. But now we come to that ominous but. I remember being at a Christian camp, serving as a counselor. In fact, I went through most of my life at that camp. The director was like a father figure to me. But on one occasion, the director called me into his office. Now, it's like going into the principal's office. So here I am, shaking and trembling, my teeth chattering, God bless America, my knees knocking home sweet home, and at that point I wish I was. But I walked into the office, sat down, and then there were all these other counselors that were higher rank than I was, standing around. It didn't look good. But the director began to say what I was doing that really motivated him, that stirred his heart. The things as a counselor that I was doing that he thought was absolutely God-given gifts. And so I was thinking, okay, this is all right. I'm feeling good about this whole conversation. Then he says, but, the ominous but. This conversation is going to take a 180 degree turn right now, and it did. They started telling me things I needed to do better, things I needed to shore up, things I needed to give attention to. Well, here we come to that ominous but in our text. Words of condemnation. I'm going to pose a question. It's a rhetorical question. I want you to think about it for a moment. Can it be possible to throw ourselves into the work of the Lord and still leave God out? Think of that for a moment. Is it possible to be so excited about our salvation experience at first that we honor God, we show Him our gratitude, we cast ourselves into kingdom work, but then as the days and the weeks and the months and the years go on, do we find maybe giving ourselves more attention to the work we're involved in rather than continuing with our relationship with the King? When I was pastor in Ellington, Connecticut, they too had a vision of building a family life center, much like the vision we have here at Turnpike. Oh, I was so wrapped up in that vision. I just sensed what God could do if we had a gymnasium, the outreach to our community how we could begin to build bridges in ways that we couldn't without that facility. Oh, I spoke about the Family Life Center. I spoke about the vision. Everywhere I went, I was talking about what God's going to do at Ellington Wesley. But it wasn't long for things would arrive. In fact, everything unraveled. And people were getting frustrated with their pastor. And I... Recall a time I just sat down and I was beside myself it's like, Lord, you placed this vision in my heart. I know it came from you. What's going on here? And I heard from God very clearly. He simply said, Norm, you've come to a place now that you worship the vision, not the vision giver. He said, you have allowed the vision to become your God and you've pushed me aside. So is it possible to get so wrapped up in the work <laughs> that all of a sudden you leave God out of it? A pastor took a survey among 100 members of various evangelical churches in his area. Now get this. These are solid churches. These are members of these churches who are active in these churches. The survey had one question, but it was twofold in its response. The question was simply this. Would it make any difference in your life if Christ had not died on the cross? If so, how? Now remember, these are active church people that the question is being posed to. 45% said it would make no difference whatsoever. No difference. 
Doesn't matter if Christ died on the cross or didn't die on the cross. Doesn't mean a thing to me. And yet they claim the title of Christianity. 25 said it would, but they couldn't explain how. They, they didn't have any reasoning for the hope that they said lies within them. 20% said it would make all the difference and vividly explained why. That's why I constantly reflect on what we are here to do at Turnpike Wesleyan. We are here to love Jesus so deeply that when we walk out of this building, we express him vividly. That we let the community see the light and we be the salt wherever God has placed us. 20% said, I want to be that light and salt. Jesus made the world a difference for me, and I can tell you how and why. 10% were unsure. They just, I don't know. <laughs> you caught me off guard with that question. Could it possibly be that these got so wrapped up in church that they developed a forgetfulness of Christ? A long while back, Penny and I were called to a different church setting. And of course, with that comes all the packing of household things and putting them in the U-Haul and making this transition from one church to another. But as I was packing up some household items, I happened to come across a wedding gift. A wedding gift that we had not used. A wedding gift that I discovered we had not even opened very often. It was a box of silver. Silver wear. Real silver wear that Penny's grand folks got us for our wedding. I opened up the box and everything in it was tarnished. Why was it tarnished? Because it was made up. It wasn't used. It was just stored away. I think our spiritual lives can be tarnished as well, become weak and fragile if we neglect our first love. So if we exhausted ourselves in the work, yet neglected our loss. And that brings us to the third expression, words of consecration. Actually, it's only one word, a great word, as we get ready to take communion, and that word is repent. God always provides a solution to every dilemma that we face. Do you agree? And he opens up his arms wide, and he says to us, hey, listen, you may be drifting, you may be involved so heavily here, but come home. Come home. Come back to the Father's love. God wants to renew his relationship and his fellowship with us this very moment today. You know, a man and a woman got involved in the fender. The woman was in tears. She had to admit she wasn't paying attention. It was her fault. But her tears just wasn't about the accident. It wasn't a severe accident. Her tears was the car was just two days old. <coughs> brand new. And she is like, oh, what is my husband going to say? How is he going to react to all of this? Well, the man she ran into was sympathetic, but explained they still needed to exchange information, registrations, license numbers, all that thing that they can submit to their insurances. And as the woman went to retrieve the information from the glove compartment, an envelope fell out. And the following was written across the front of the envelope. In case of an accident, read first. So she thought maybe it had insurance papers in it, maybe it had some other material documents in it that she needed to look at. So she opened it up, and all it was was a simple note. It said this, Remember, honey, it is you that I love, not the car. <laughs> Boy, I probably took a big look off her shoulders. But I think this has always been the message of the cross, don't you? That Jesus says, remember, you may have messed up. There may be some fender benders along the way. But it's you I love. It's you I died for. It's you who I want to reclaim. So as we get ready to partake of communion, can we honestly say, I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, my soul, my strength, and my mind. As we get ready to break bread together, may we ourselves experience a brokenness within us and ask the Lord to renew a right spirit within us, to restore 
our souls. Let me just share briefly what communion offers us today. And then I'm going to ask Lisa to come to the piano to play softly while we just spend moments in listening to the music, in silence, lifting our prayers in every word. Pastor Judy is going to come forward too to help with the communion as we get ready to take it. Our Lord himself gave us this supper. In the simple elements, it represents his body and blood. We do have a memorial from his very own hands. At this table, we meet with our Savior. We look back upon his sacrifice and suffering. We ask for and receive forgiveness. We renew our commitment to our Lord and our commitment to one another, to love one another. And we rejuvenate our hope that soon and very soon, he's coming again. So you see, there's much offered as we come to the table. Christ is here. He's in the house. And he wants to speak into your heart and mine alike. So let us just bow our hearts before his presence as Lisa plays through our song of communion, the verse in the chorus, and then we're going to stand together and as we sing this particular song, we're going to start with the back row. If you'll come forward down the center aisle, receive both elements. Return to your seat using the side aisles. And once everybody's received their elements, then we'll partake together of this song. 